Well, you've heard a lot from me today. Sorry about that. In a couple of weeks, uh, you won't have to hear as much. There's a uh, soapbox sermon starting as our sermon pattern around here. If you haven't yet signed up for a soapbox sermon, you can on that little sheet there. Soapbox sermons are 10-minute sermons that people are invited to do in the gatherings. Uh, they'll start in June. We will uh, have uh, it'll follow a pattern of what's often referred to as the Beatitudes out of Jesus' most famous sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, it's so each week there's like the first one is blessed are the poor in spirit for they will see God. So one person is invited to do or two people are invited to do a refrain on that passage. Some might take the first and some the second. You put it together and partner with someone if you want. The, the, the sheet is there for that if that's something that you're interested in. There's five spots left, I think. So feel free to um, sign up for one of those. By the way, Memorial Day weekend, which is Memorial Day is the first holiday, Monday holiday of the summer. Labor Day is the last one. So it's the one in May. So Memorial Day is, i talk to you like your third graders or something, but some of us get confused with Memorial Day and Labor Day. Anyway, Memorial Day is the one that's coming. It's like May 28th or something. And uh, that gathering, we're going to do a little differently. It's going to be a combination of our annual outside picnic here on the sidewalk and street and also our cleaning day. So we're not going to have a normal gathering like this. It's going to be a work day in and around the place and rolling into a... a uh, uh, picnic outside, so it's going to be very Memorial Day feeling to it. So uh, be sure to come on that day, and then the soapbox sermons will start. We'll, we'll start after that. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm wearing a pair of very uh, uh, fashion-forward shoes, uh, which is not totally my thing. Uh, some of you have been kind enough to say something. Some of you have just been noticing and then smirking, and I appreciate that. Uh, that, that either way. Okay, so here's the story on these shoes, which actually has a lot to do with what I wanted to talk about today in the, in, in the sermon. We're doing sermons as sort of a prelude, a prequel to the soapbox sermons with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Um, so my son Taylor, uh, he works for a company who puts together promotions for, uh, to launch brands. So he lives in New York. They do a lot of New York branding. And so his client is Nike, and they produced an event because Nike is launching a series of 16 commemorative shoes. The commemorative shoes are all shoes that were worn uh, by someone who won a championship that and there the shoe that they wore that shoe is being re-released as a part of a collection this set uh, of shoes that tell that story so this particular shoe i don't know if somebody knows can anybody say if you saw that shoe just right off the bat that converse white converse with the red on it uh did anybody know who would have worn this shoe for a championship not larry bird yeah, Dr. J. Julius Irving. So on the little uh, gold bling that's on the front of the lace, it says 1980. Then there's a little gold bling here on the side, which is the championship trophy uh, that he won. Then inside the shoe, it says that it's a part of the collection. And then on the, it, like everywhere on the shoe, it tells you something about this story. Then there's a little tag that comes with it that tells the story of Julius Irving winning that championship. And this particular shoe is called the Scoop. So if you're a basketball fan or old enough, you might remember <laughs> that Julius Irving is that, that really famous one where he goes up on the right side. I mean, I was in eighth grade and I was a basketball player. So, I mean, I remember it just so clearly. And I've, I've seen myself do it a hundred times where I become Julius Irving, right? But he goes up with the ball on the one side and someone's come and he stays in the air and somehow swoops under the basket and comes up the other side with this, this called the scoop. And it was... Just a mind-bending experience, right? Um, and so that moment is captured. It's captured in my mind. Then that moment is captured by the Nike promotion team. They decide they want to put this together. Our son gets whooped into this. He builds the whole show that launches all of these. That's how I end up with a pair of these commemorative shoes. So anyway, they're launching all these shoes. You can go buy 16 shoes that all are championship one, men's sports, women's sports, basketball, all the rest. This is the, the Julia serving one. So uh, today I opened these sh shoes in this box that Taylor sent to me. And I'm like, these are... I mean, I was awfully self-conscious in the kitchen. And Shelly said, no, no, you should wear them. And I'm going to Philadelphia on Tuesday. And uh, he was uh, played for the Philadelphia 76ers. I'm, get, I'm getting arrested in a protest um, to try to raise awareness about bringing an end to assault uh, weapons. So I'm like, I'm going to wear those there uh, because they sort of tell the story of uh, Philadelphia and all the rest of this, right? 
And I started thinking about all that goes into this shoe. There was this moment that Dr. J, Julie Serving, did a thing. Then a whole bunch of people were moved by that thing that he did. This scoop, winning a championship, being a great basketball player. That thing he did then gets commemorated into a marketing brand to resell you shoes from, I don't know, 38 years later, something like that, whatever, 1980, 2038 years, is that, is that math right? 38 years later, these shoes are then being sold to commemorate, and then they, you know, put a little bling on it and kind of tell a story. That's awfully similar to what happens to a lot of great action, and I tend to think that's some of what happens to the life of Jesus. There was this life lived that did something spectacular, captured imagination. People were moved by it. People remember it. People could see themselves making the very same scoop, right? They say, like, that's the kind of life that I would like to live. That's something motivating. And then a bunch of well-intentioned people keep retelling that story into the shape that it becomes commemorated into sort of a blingy, curious kind of form where you're telling that story. So Christianity's had this kind of arc that has followed something very similar to what happened on that day in June in 1980 and then winds itself up on that day in May in 2018 in a new pair of shoes being released. What some of us want to do in the Christian story is not just wear the commemorative bling. You actually want to shoot that shot, play that game, be part of that activity. So some of our sermon conversations around here are directly about that. Today's is going to be. Uh, We've been, uh, last two weeks, we talked about Jesus as a movement leader. How could we be those people that are part of a movement of life, seeing Jesus as an example of what humanity could be. Today, uh, the focus is Jesus as a savior, and next week, Jesus as a a teacher, particularly. So this idea of Jesus as a savior, for a lot of people, can be the most discomforting. For some people, it's the best. When I got into Christianity, I was, was, uh, the phrase that the Christians I hung around with in 1983 uh, was, To understand Jesus as your personal, that was a really important word, Lord and Savior. This kind of phrase, your personal Lord and Savior. Maybe you've heard that phrase, maybe you grew up in a tradition that talked like that, be around people who talked like that. And those words were really important. And we spent a lot of time in the world I was in, and I guess I still do, sort of tricking out what those words mean, what that's, what that's about, what that's, what that's getting at. But that word Savior, for me, took on a certain kind of, the people I was around had a certain connotation. And what I was never comfortable with, but the people I was hanging around with were very comfortable with, was that Jesus somehow saved you from God, from the wrath of God. That God had a thing out for you. I mean, it was a weird sort of deal. I don't know. I mean, it's hard for me to talk about it at all without sounding like I'm just being snarky, but, so I'll try to be careful. But it was sort of a, a weirdly broken relationship where it was all about love. But there was also this really severe sense of punishment. So you were going to be saved from the punishment of God so that you could be in the love of God. But it was all the same God. And Jesus was the Savior that moved you from the punishment category to the love category. And for any of us that have been in any relationship in which punishment and love are intertwined like that, that's super unhealthy, right? So I never kind of liked that. I don't even know that the people I was hanging around with really thought that way or thought that through, they would just sort of talk about being saved from judgment. And judgment was the judgment of God. Then a little while later, I started hanging around some people who were saying in college, this was, who started saying, you know, a much better way to think about Jesus as a savior is that you're saved not from God. You're saved from destruction or from sin or you're saved from the devil. That People start talking like that. Um, That felt a little bit better, but it also didn't really seem right. I felt like a patsy in the game, like somehow I was the pawn that was being uh, that was being fought over. And I didn't really like that. It felt very disempowering, like it really had nothing to. Again, it was like a status or a status that I was in. I was either saved or not saved. And that felt weird. And I didn't think that really captured any of the kind of language of 
savioring for Jesus. And by the way, the word savior, Jesus as your savior, that's more one of the commemorative uh, carryovers of our faith than it is like right from the storyline. Um, it, it's a phrase we've tended to apply to a whole lot of the story, an external category that we've applied. So anyway, today I want to talk, uh, t- talk a bit about that. Um, I, Give you a moment because I'd like to do one of those quick rounds where we go around the room and have anybody who wants to share what comes to your mind when you hear Jesus as a Savior. We've been trying to use around this community for a long time phrases like, what's the agenda of Jesus for humanity or what's the desire of Jesus for humanity? What is the belief of Jesus about humanity? What's the call of Jesus? What's the, what are the dreams of Jesus for humanity? What are the hopes of Jesus for humanity? What are the ways of Jesus for humanity? Um, this idea of Jesus as your Savior uh, I have some thoughts about that um, that uh, I, I want to uh, share with you here in a second. But I want to see here what you, uh, what comes to your minds, anybody who's willing to share, when you hear a phrase, Jesus as Savior. What, what, what stirs up in, in, in you? Think of original sin. Ah. Mm-hmm. So there's kind of a, a, a original sin as a something a, 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 per, a, a beginning blem, a beginning yeah. darkness or blemish. No longer because of the dirty view, we can't be saved. Yeah. So Jesus wants to save us. Okay. Yeah. Um, people who feel like they've been personally saved by Jesus, my sense, and myself and people who is, I guess, saved from lovelessness. Saved from lovelessness. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, say, oh. <laughs> um, uh, like a sense that we are held in love. Yeah. That we are absolutely and utterly loved as we are conditioned to be and so is everyone else. And that, just that, does a whole lot of things. Yeah. Thanks. Anyone else? What comes to mind? Yeah. See, when I hear Savior, a lot of times the way I used to hear it a lot is saying that Jesus is your Savior and Lord. So yeah. they would combine those two together. Uh-huh. So saving you from your sins, but also Lord uh, in that terminology of the one that you serve. Yeah. Yeah, Danielle. Yeah. I, I think uh, this concept of Savior always feels really shape shifting to me mm-hmm. um, in the sense that. It, it seems really uh, individual what people need to be saved from, yeah. right? So, like, from uh, if, for some people, their work is to become softer and more tender, where for some people, they need to be sort of uh, saved from their meekness. And, and so it really feels almost like when you project on someone that you're, like, meeting by, <coughs> by text or some dating app, where you're just projecting on them on a a blank sort of palette what you need and sort of making it up that feels nice, difficult yeah. but I just mean mm-hmm. like if I, I actually don't know I, I yeah. don't know if there is an absolute sense I just get the sense that Savior is sort of like a fill in the blank whatever you yeah. probably need to be yeah. saving from and if yeah. that's the inspiration for you you probably can you know look at the story of Jesus or the behavior or, or the ethos of Jesus and, and find your thing yeah yeah, can I, can I pivot off of that one? Because that's something that I was thinking about uh, as well. Let me think just went crazy here. Sorry about that. Um, I think that's, that this whole save business is about the flourishing of humanity. That's another one of these phrases that I, I think we could think about Jesus' agenda about. That there's a flourishing of humanity that we want to see it come to life. And in that, there's a liberating sense to saving, right? That... Uh, and I really like this idea, Danielle, that, that the thing you're saved from, and I also want to suggest a category of the thing you're saved for, which is a, a whole other kind of concept, and actually might have a lot more to do with any kind of language about savioring, uh, that it's what you're saved for and not what you're saved from. But, um, but there's just kind of a liberating that is very conditional. And if you were to... Think about the biblical narrative or the ways in which human beings have thought about being saved from the elements that exist on the planet. We are constantly living in the sense of being saved from things. Sometimes you're being saved from the earth when there's 
you know, lava shooting out of the ground and you're in Hawaii. People are on the move. It's like the earth is opening up and tries to kill you, right? There's that sort of notion there. Sometimes you're being saved uh, from the wind. So many times people uh, have to create severe protection from the wind. Obviously, saved from fire is something that we all know. Being saved from water, being saved from one another, being saved from microbes and viruses and bacteria. Like we live in a, as human beings in a constant sense of thinking about ourselves and one another's and trying to stay safe so that we can flourish. And I think that's part of what the agenda of Jesus is about. Is that human flourishing? So this story that Jesus tells, the thing that we commemorate, the thing that we want to join into, the pathway that we want to be on, it really is about that, the very real life about what it is that you're finding yourself saved from. Okay, Uh, the other thing is sometimes we have to save ourselves from just literally being shit upon. Uh, Like in this picture from uh, the other day, I was sitting outside a little cafe. I was in uh, Northern California on on Thursday. It was lovely. Everything was great. I finished up my work, closed my computer, walked over to my bag, and no kidding, a bird in the tree over the top had pooped right on my bag. And I sort of thought like, huh, yeah, we do really have to find ourselves safe from all that. And sometimes, and maybe, uh, I don't know this is what you were talking about, sometimes we just crap on each other. And sometimes we've got to be saved from just that very act of feeling like you're getting... uh, uh, The thing that's supposed to go in the garbage heap is the thing that fell on you. In fact, interestingly, the language... There are uh, seven times where Jesus uses a phrase in the Gospels, and it's only in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where he uses a phrase that the English translators translate as the word hell which is never the word hell in the language is used. Uh, it's sort of a, that's sort of a representational word. The word that's used is most often the word for this, this garbage area in, the, in a valley right outside Jerusalem, sort of the garbage dump area. So what Jesus refers to as save, uh, you know, uh, gouge out your eye if you have to so your whole body doesn't burn in, if in English translations you might read hell, was in this garbage area. Uh, keep yourself from being sort of thrown away. Sometimes we save things because uh, by getting rid of something. Sometimes we save something by not letting it be thrown away, that both of those are actions. So the, there's this sense that what Jesus gets at in that phrase of salvation is not uh, the wrath of God or even the wrath of the devil per se, but it is don't let that which is valuable be treated as if it's Sewage, and don't let that which is uh, should be saved to be thrown into those places, and order life so that the things that are good and right are in their good and right places. There's also this sense of being saved, uh, saved from being lost. And I asked Shelley if she'd give just a, a quick story uh, about one about a time when uh, she got lost. So are you, are you comfortable with that? Because I think this this. Uh, Saving of a, of a thing, which you do want to talk about, and that's a way to think about ourselves, is a little different than that sense when you feel like you are in the need of some kind of, I don't know, uh, being saved. And Shelly has a dramatic story to tell. So um, we're married, and I call Duke, for those of you that don't know that. So uh, we were in South Dakota a few years back. A, few, a group of people actually from this community caravaned um, through the state to um, the Black Hills. And we were staying at a camp, and that camp was on a logging, a huge acreage of a logging piece of land. And one day, all of us went out to dig in a little piece of dirt to find gardens, and that was super fun. And the next day, because I like to walk, and I particularly like to walk alone, um, I was like, oh, I'm going to go for a walk by myself. Well, first, I actually did ask one person if they wanted to come. And then I decided to walk by myself, and I thought, I'm going to go back up by that garnet hill. I know where that's at. Remember, it's acres of logging. So I walk up by the Garnet Hill, and then I was like, okay, I'm done with this. They said there's a little pond back here, a lake. I'm going to go see that lake, and I'm going to walk around the lake, and then I'll just come back. I'll follow my same path. So I did that. The lake was beautiful. I turned around, and I came back down the path that I knew to be true. And then I kept walking, and I kept walking, and I kept walking. And I was like, this is clearly not the path that I was on before. And the fear started to come up in me, and I was 
fearful of the cougars that they said come out at night. I was fearful because I always walked with my water bottle. And this was literally an hour and a half, and then two hours, and then three hours later. I had no water. I'm scared talking about it. I had no water. In South Dakota, um, when it gets dark, it gets really cold. In the daytime, it's really hot. And I had no extra clothing, and I was petrified. And I was paralyzed at one moment, looking around like, there's nothing but, oh, this is this is the pile of logs. I, I, I think this is the one I walked past before, and then I walk again. Oh, there's another pile of logs. It looks exactly like the other pile of logs. I didn't know where I was, and gradually, after a couple, three hours of walking, trying to find my way, I saw a car going down a road, and I paused and I waited. Is there another car? Okay, there's another car going down that road. So I walked toward that road to try to find out um, if there was a place to be, and finally, following uh, the cars, I came upon a little opening, and in that opening was a shack, and there was one pickup truck in front of that shack, and I thought, I'm going to get raped. I'm just going to get raped. <laughs> no, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then I looked a little bit further down, and there was another place, and there were two cars there. And so I thought, I'm going to go there. And I was able to make my way there. It wasn't quite dark, and um, it happened that the, the people there knew where I had come from, the camp, and that this camp was associated with that camp, though it did not look like a camp at all. So she took me to her pickup truck and drove me back to the camp. And my friends and my husband were there, and I was like, oh, I was so relieved. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so Still reliving the trauma of it. It's awesome. Um, Yeah. The person missing, and you couldn't find her. There was like right. a four wheel, like, excursion or something. Right? Yeah. You couldn't find her, and then all of a sudden there was this person missing, so there was this whole other side of that loss. Yeah. That I think some of us experience when you, a loved one is lost, you experience that missing of them. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, thank you, Cheka. And that is. That's most co- If you were to read through the Gospels, that language is really common. That's a thing that shows up. A kind of that sense of like, the, I, I'm not where I want to be and I'm not in a place where I feel safe or someone's missing. And can I go get them? Can we go find them? Is there something we could do? That's a different kind of a, of a savior narrative. And I think it's a really, uh, I actually think it's a really powerful one. Um, because you look for someone to be, well, I'm just going to skip all that stuff. This being saved from and being saved for. And then there's this other notion that you're saved in a way that is, you're found. You know what I mean? That, that kind of foundness. Um, so I was really hesitant about a category of Jesus that would be savior business because... Um, <coughs> Uh, I haven't reconciled it fully back into my own spirituality yet in the same way that I have like Jesus as a movement leader or Jesus as an example or Jesus as a teacher. Uh, so I feel, uh, I feel awkward about that one, like how that, how that one gets brought back in to the story um, other than this saved for and saved uh, for something, for usefulness, for goodness, for benefit, for blessing, um, when, when you are on your phone and you have an image that you swipe up, it'll say, do you want to save this for something? And a lot of us save that image because we think maybe, we're gonna, maybe it's going to be used for something someday. And I, I think there's a way of Jesus that, is, that allows us to realign what we would save in the world and how we would be saved. But I think this lostness is even better. All right, so open conversation here. Anybody, if we just have a couple of minutes left before the little ones come back in. Um, uh, th- thoughts about this saving business? Yeah, Lana. Um, my concern about that is that I wonder if it implies that all of us are means with some sort of end. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. we're, we're safe for these things that we benefit from. Like, we're not saved for any of the other things. Like, we're not saved for the blessing. Like, only to the extent that we do those things. That's what we're here for. Yeah, nice. As opposed to being ends in ourselves, like Khan talks yeah. about. You know, we're supposed to treat other people as their, as their ends in themselves. Nice. Like, and something actually I've been working on lately is starting to feel like I am an end in yes. myself. Yes. 
Um, Yeah, nice. Very good. Yeah, I like that. Thank you for that. Yeah. Restorative. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I guess, like, do you really think that, like, Jesus is Savior? Yeah, is even, like, the correct uh, picture as opposed to, like, restorative? Yeah, yeah like, like what, what, what's my own opinion? Yeah. Uh, I like those words a, a lot more. And I don't know if that's because I just have a lot of baggage with kind of savior stuff. Uh, I, and I get it in the sense of like you want someone to come find you when you feel lost. and you. you um, uh, but yeah, I, I think so too. I mean, I like liberation. I like restoration. I like the shun words, you know, so salvation somehow feels okay. Savior uh, feels a little different. So I, yeah, I think I'm doing something funny with that. Um, but I do think there's a human impulse that recognizes the need to save something from and something for, that we want, that things are valuable and we want to make sure they don't get harmed, so they can be restored. Um, yeah, it, but it's, it's such a power, again, I don't know if it's a powerful notion. Like in the phrase that I heard, Jesus is your personal Lord and Savior. I really like the personal side of it, sort of to these notions and to that notion. Like, and I really like the idea that Jesus doesn't say the same thing to any two people. Everybody's got their own deal, right? One, we're going to have a party at your house. One, go sell everything. One, don't tell anyone. One, go tell everyone. Everyone's got their own plan that they're working. You know, everyone's in their own, in their own way. So that personal thing feels really important in the Lord and personal in the Savior that the flourishing of an individual and of all of humanity is what's paramount of importance to God, that God's on human side and God's not competing with humanity and God's, you know, full participant with humanity and all things. So savior as participant feels really good. God is participant. When it becomes that other thing, I, I, it, it's less, less tantalizing to me. Um, some people talk about savior in words, in language, that, and in a, a narrative that's really compelling and powerful. And, and when, they, when they do that, I watch people who have been through recovery or people that have been in prison. When they talk about this, oh, man, it goes to a whole other level of like, oh, you're tapping into something I'm not tapping into. So, uh, yeah, I, I, don't want, I don't want to take that away as sort of a high-level category, but at the same time... All right, one more comment. Little sweeties are here, and they're going to be bearing gifts for women of all kinds. So, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. right. If you don't have this, you're, you're on the outside. Yeah. It's a high. It's a high level value proposition for religious systems to pitch a salvation narrative. Yeah. Yeah. 
good. Thanks. Hey, the little sweeties have flowers for uh, uh, women of all of all kinds. And you know, take a picture of that. That's about as cute as it comes, right there. That's, that's Sunday morning sappy sweetness. Hey, thanks all.